re really pleased with our, our efforts and the results of this uh, class, our 2019 class. Um, so I believe that uh, organizations are perfectly designed for the results they get. Uh, I was taught that through organizational behavior over the past number of years. And with Carla's help, we've been able to, to add uh, additional resources in our personnel department. And I think that's reflected partly in uh, the quality of this class. So I think that was one contributor to the improvement uh, that we've shown. Uh, the second influencer is just simply uh, it's year three and we're making progress that um, is clear and noticeable and transparent for all to see. So the combination of progress with resources is now combining to produce a stronger result. Um, this class uh, I think is uh, very good for the University of Virginia, meaning that um, of this class I think uh, uh, 14 of the players uh, are strong academically, well over 3.0 grade point average. There's a couple that have 4.0s within that. 12 of the 19 or so are multi-sport athletes, which means they do a lot of different things. So when you talk about the quality of people, the, the versatility which they have, the kind of students, and then Division I football players at the ACC level, um, they're perfect fits for us. Uh, there has been... Um, no significant changes on signing day, which we have an organizational or guiding principle which says less drama, more work. So this was not one of those uh, days where our coaches were pulling our hair out. We just simply um, had the players that were committed. They signed because they were committed and we went out to practice. And so that's also reflective of the trust that's been established between player and coach under the guiding principles of the program. And so that, uh, that also was very positive. I think the class, again, we're always looking for greater than, not equal to, and everything in our program. And this is uh, in relation to our first class that um, our staff signed. We played 17 of those players, which was fourth most in college football. That was the 17th, the 17 class. 18's class, uh, based on one report, uh, said that we were the sixth youngest roster in college football. Um, and so you'll have to verify that. That now leads us to this class, which is our third class, which is um, uh, a th basically three-fourths of the way done um, in terms of having four consecutive classes with four consecutive years of improvement and the results that then show that not only on the field but um, through recruiting. I think we addressed um, needs uh, that had to be addressed. Certainly um, with the graduation at running back of Jordan Ellis, we needed a, a really strong running back. And uh, with both Seneca and Michael, uh, we feel very strong there. We continue to look to expand and build our outside receiving core, uh, which we think is, is still at a deficit um, in terms of numbers. And so we added good players um, on the outside that I think will really help us. Um, and Nathaniel and Dorian and Dontavian. And so I feel really good about that. We continue to put emphasis into our offensive front uh, by not only uh, size, mindset, but by ability and numbers. We've addressed that. We needed to expand our defensive front in terms of quality play and depth. Um, and so two very good young prospects there. Um, and Jawan and Ben uh, really like them. Our linebackers are already strong. We added to that, and we added more speed in our secondary. So really, uh, in addition to all that, the next version of quarterback also was signed um, in R.J. Harvey. Um, so uh, almost all areas, at least at the initial stages of the class, as far as we can evaluate through high school, have been addressed and met and at a high level. And so I'm encouraged, excited, and think momentum has been generated for our program, um, for our team, uh, and uh, for all parties around the program. So I'll be glad to take questions if there are some. So uh, Coach, I'd like to talk about two of the, the guys you signed kind of late. Tenye Dixon, the quarterback, and Nathaniel Bill, you just mentioned. How confident were you that you were going to get those guys coming into today? Um, so the two players, uh, Tenye Dixon, visited this past weekend. And uh, Coach Howell had done a really nice job recruiting him. Uh, he had committed to another institution previously. Um, and as our needs 
uh, and shifted slightly. Um, that became um, a really strong possibility. On the visit, uh, I felt really good that we had a, a great chance. And then uh, early on, after the visit on Sunday, we received his commitment, which he held. Um, and so that's pretty typical with us, as commitments do hold. And so um, I was confident as of Sunday that that would happen, and it did. Uh, Nathaniel's visit was earlier um, after having been committed to another institution for quite some time. Uh, he visited and it was just a natural fit. And so um, uh, Nathaniel in particular has really nice size. We, we call players with that size always open, meaning that most corners that are matched up against them, there, there aren't many 6'3 or 6'4 or 6'5 corners. And so whether they're behind him or not, they're always open. We wanted more size on the outside. We wanted more productivity, and we needed more consistency. And so uh, Nathaniel, man, that was a, a really nice addition to this class, and we're really excited about him. I uh, was curious about your two running backs, and uh, what what specifically do you like about their games? Yeah, really distinct in style. Uh, Mike Hollins is uh, the, the next version of, of J.E. Uh, with probably more speed and more productivity coming out of high school. Um, I think he was the best running back in, in the state of Louisiana. He was the MVP of the state championship game. I think he's powerful. I think he has great vision. I think he's durable. I think he's tough. And man, is he productive. And so I really like him. But uh, when I say comparable to J.E., you'll see his body is similar. Um, he's physical and he's compact but he's also dynamic and so probably um, the next version in terms of big play threat in addition to what JE is um, so we really like that uh, as a comparison because that's the greatest compliment I could give Mike is to compare him to JE and then if you watch what he's done at the highest level really uh, of Louisiana football um, he's uh, I think he's he's very good and his numbers say that or show that uh, Seneca is is extremely uh, fast, quick, explosive, dynamic, um, hard to find, hard to catch, hard to tackle, and he scores a lot of touchdowns. And he can play a bunch of different positions, um, meaning quarterback, meaning receiver, meaning running back, anything where the ball can be in his hands, that's where we want him. We like him uh, for his size. We th also think he's physical. He's one of the fastest players uh, in the country as well in the 100 meters. Um, and so, yeah, lots of uh, big play potential. And so when you put those two together in the backfield, uh, our production and the dynamic nature of what we can do in the run game um, starts to become, I think, more powerful. Coach, you, have a, you haven't always, I guess, let us talk to freshmen, right? Jawan Briggs seems like to me the kind of kid that maybe you should <laughs> reconsult, you know, take, <laughs> take that under advisement or something. <laughs> Have you ever met a kid who was both that talented on the field, but that well-rounded off of it? And 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 when did when how would you sort of measure him against other guys you've recruited? Yeah, I, I don't I don't think it's measurable uh, for him against someone else. I mem I remember on his visit, uh, my wife and I, Holly, were visiting with him, and he he told us he played ten instruments, and so that puts him in a pretty elite class. I would say of all the signees in this year's class at any level of football, anyone else that plays 10 instruments. Um, and then I just saw a video of his a Christmas performance duet. If you haven't seen that online, I highly recommend that. Uh, my family and I have watched that many, many times now. He's exceptional in visiting his high school, which is phenomenal. Uh, there's private rooms where violin and piano and voice is all being practiced. Um, uh, one of the, uh, the choir teachers stopped and, and stopped his class and they gave us an impromptu a cappella um, presentation just because we were there. Uh, by the way, when uh, Juwan got us, he, he left his class, which was engineering, they were building um, chairs out of cardboard to see which could be the, 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 um, the most weight bearing. And so there was that competition going on, which followed a roller coaster. Um, competition design that was previous year. So there was engineering, there were the arts, uh, and then um, every class it was just engaged. And so Joan is, 
he's a renaissance man he is uh he's uva um and he could probably walk into to any field here and have success um right from the beginning and in terms of the policy uh yeah you'll still have to wait um and we'll just let we'll just let the the um the momentum build for that and then unleash him i know you're not very big on star ratings and such but when you do sign a young man who has who is as acclaimed as Jawan, does it affect outside perception of your program and is that something that you welcome so in in all three parts yes i'm not big on star ratings um as a baseline it certainly does affect perception um because there's rankings that happen and it's reportable right signing day is reportable so class rankings and stars there's an outcome from that which then generates momentum or sometimes can hurt momentum based on what your class looks like. So our momentum generated by this class, by um, outside and objective um, raters, uh, has this class fairly high, which means that there's a perception of momentum and positive things happening at UVA. In this particular case, it just happens to be right. Uh, we are gaining momentum. Uh, the class is strong. <laughs> and so, yeah, um, uh, just was one of those things that aligns. Um, and I'm excited about that. Uh, and I think it has a really nice benefit to our program. Uh, but again, that's coinciding partly with um, the progress that's been made already specifically with the two recruiting classes that our staff have, has brought and the two bowl games that they've yielded and the, the recruits simply see that uh, this is just the beginning and they more and more want to be part of it. What can you say about the wide receivers in this class? Ta just taking a look at the three of them, all of them are big guys and especially guys like Dorian Goddard coming from a good high school like Greenville High School. We, we love um, winners and state champions. I believe there was three three state champions in this class. Uh, Dorian, uh, man, the number of catches alone is is really, uh, really impactful and really impressive. But we wanted size, uh, we wanted speed, and again, we want players that are always open. And so Dorian uh, was one of our earliest commits at receiver, and we really like his productivity. Dontavian is, is the, the youngest in the game and maturity, uh, but then when you watch um, some of the dunks that he has in basketball and some of the dynamic measurables and his upside is tremendous with really nice size also. And then Nathaniel Beal, as I've already talked about, the, the tallest and longest of them all with not only downfield uh, ability, uh, but this, this matchup that is always problematic for a defense. So again, it was targeted specifically. We need more yield from our outside receivers. And so we targeted um, that specifically, uh, and I like the three players that we we landed. Bronco back here. How would you how would you just describe your strategy when recruiting quarter? Do, do you want a quarterback in every class to kind of build that hierarchy, or what's the strategy at that position? Yeah, the succession planning at quarterback has been um, one of the first things we had to address, and and just now am I starting to get comfortable? So we have Bryce, and then currently behind Bryce uh, we have Brennan. And, um, and then we also have Lindell. And so there's three quarterbacks that I think are capable. Lindell is at a completely different style than the other two, but what Brennan has already shown is in alignment, but not identical to what Bryce can do. So that allowed some consistency. Um, what I would love is a quarterback in each class. That's my ideal. So you have a fourth year, third year, second year, first year, and then you're recruiting one. Um, so that's my ideal we will have before this class finishes you'll see five quarterbacks on scholarship by the time this class is finished. Um, we really liked um, RJ, um, and uh, there was a game we watched, and his team was, was playing against uh, one of the top 50 running backs in the country, and RJ at quarterback we thought was a significantly better running back than the running back that that's all he played. And Bryce would be similar. And so RJ's packaging is much more Marcus Hagens-ish. Um, and we're hoping that the result is Marcus Hagens-ish in terms of the dynamic player. So he's, he's not built the same as Bryce, but wow, is he dynamic and effective and really helped his team uh, play well. So my ideal and answer to the question is, is to have one in each class with one being recruited. And 
that's uh, for the first time we're, we're going to be at that point. Coach, a uh, two-part question. Uh, first, especially the top half of this class, very defense-heavy. Was that by design? Um, not necessarily. Sometimes it just works by um, uh, when players choose to make up their minds and when they intend uh, to commit. Um, so we've been really clear and really intentional on all of our players and what uh, specifications we want. And uh, Coach Soto, again, did a really nice job with the defensive line, Coach Papinga and Coach Hunter. Um, there will be one more player that will be added this evening um, at probably 6 o'clock. Um, that, that will close out the signing day for today. Um, and so Coach Papinga and Coach Hunter at linebacker and Coach Howell in the secondary, we've been together just so long that there's a different level of momentum uh, uh, and they think as I think. So there's a little less translation that needs to happen just because we've been in the same room so long and we're clearer, uh, maybe in a little bit clearer of, of that, what it is on our offensive side. And the overall team speed of this class, I mean, Cypress, Williams, Millage, all these guys are state track champions. Was it a goal to, to improve the team speed with these guys? It is. Uh, speed usually leads to scoring. And anytime you have three players that are all anywhere from 10-4 to 10-600 meters, that starts to look um, very effective. In the secondary, it's recovery speed. When you're a ball carrier, it's hard to recover to catch up to someone running that fast. You had mentioned Nathaniel earlier having been committed elsewhere. How did that relationship start after he decided that he was no longer going to Iowa State and how did it evolve from that? We, we, were, we were looking specifically for long and tall and productive and talented receivers and that doesn't exclude us from talking to or reaching out to those that are committed elsewhere. And as we reached out and, and started that relationship, uh, there became a sincere interest um, from Nathaniel back to us because of the academics, because of the need, and then um, the style of play, but also where we are in the program and the impact that he could have. And so that all started this intrigue, which then just blossomed into a recruiting visit not too long ago. Um, so you're talking basically about a year-long relationship with an institution he was committed to, and then a pretty short and, um, and fast turnaround which means the impact that was made and just the clear fit between both parties that has to be like that or it doesn't override that long of relationship. In this case, it did. We saw that, they felt that, and knew it as well. And so um, I think he benefited by being able to come to the University of Virginia, and we certainly benefited by, by having him join us. And then you have mentioned previously kind of the jarring transition you found in the recruiting dynamic at Brigham Young where your oh, yeah. acceptance rate was nearly half to here where it started like in the eight to nine yeah. to one range. Are you finding your acceptance ratio is now improving or are you still kind of in that range that you had mentioned? No, previously? significantly improved uh, partly because we're more intentional now after we've learned and are still learning um, I guess the point of reference of UVA, where we currently are in the market, establishing relationships in our footprint, and then knowing exactly who to go after um, and what are the key predictors that has, and, and then with the success we're having, that has made um, the rate of number of recruits to commitment uh, significantly lower. So um, it's still not ideal. I would say probably five or four to one is where it is now, but in relation to where it was, and we've closed the gap and made significant improvement. So part of it is relationships, part of it is knowledge of our current um, circumstances, but then knowing our existing team, now seeing the coastal, now seeing the ACC and becoming more clear and, and more specific on exactly what we need, all of that has combined to, to make it to where uh, the number of players recruited isn't having to be as large as it was to get the commitments we need. I know the offensive line has been something that's been on your mind since you got here. Um, how do these three guys fit into your uh, vision? Yeah, there, there is um, the size and ability is part of it. Uh, the mindset is also part of it. So. It's not only what we're going to do, it's how we're going to do it, and we think those are equal parts. To have the size and the ability without the mindset um, to help us win the Coastal and take over the ACC, that would be a deal breaker. And so we're really looking for both. Do they have enough ability and do they have the mindset? And so 
man, we've put a lot of time and effort into this group um, to solidify both those things. And we're now, again, having enough success and we're generating enough momentum where we're able to choose and select uh, and at a little bit higher level and we are becoming more desirable. And so the quality is going up not only on the field, but it's also going up mindset wise. And so, um, again, this group has to be um, better than our last group and next year has to be better than that. Again, just to continue, uh, that's nothing against our current players, but just to continue the growth and progress needed for the program um, to make the kind of strides we continue to need, we continue to need and desire and knowing that as you reach a certain number of wins, it, um, success in our bowl game would mean eight. Nine wins is a lot harder to get than eight. <laughs> Those kind of jumps become harder just to get one more. And so who you bring in has a lot of impact on that. Our current players, their job then is they have to train so fiercely that they don't get past. And ultimately then that friction elevates the whole group, which is what we need. So we not only need numbers, but we need mindset. And I think this, is, this class and these additions will be really helpful. Bronco, you've had some over here, some uh, landmark moments the last couple of years, beating, winning at Boise State, beating Miami, going to the second straight bowl. How how tangible is the effect of those things during recruiting? It, it is. Um, I, I don't know what percentage to put on it, but it's tangible. It's noticeable, and everywhere we go now, no matter what school, um, the the sentiment is, man, holy cow, you guys are getting better and holy cow that you're going back to postseason and, and what's happening at Virginia. So it's, it's just kind of the same narrative wherever we go. And so many teams then, or so many people then say, jump right to, wow, there's two overtime games. That could have been nine. You guys could, you guys could be at nine. And, and so they're seeing how close it is. And there's this optimism of not only are we going back to post postseason back to back, but they're saying, Wait, this realistically could have been even more than that in year three, which isn't much of a stretch. And so all that is generating this excitement as to a couple more plays or a couple more players. And uh, I think folks are thinking we're, we're closer than maybe what seven wins showed. And so momentum is what's happening. And it's real and it's tangible regardless of state, regardless of the high school we walk into. Um, and so totally noticeable, uh, much more so this year than last year. Um, just as I've been out on the road. I ask this question every year, um, and I'll ask it again. So as you go forward now, what are some needs that you feel like this class still has? What are some things that mm. maybe you would you wish were different about this group, and now that you have a little bit of time to address that before the more traditional national sign of day? Yeah, um, so I really feel like our needs have been addressed. So we could stop now, and and I'm comfortable and confident and happy with our class and really excited about the direction and the future of our program. If you then start to say um, extra credit, you know, or what what now is possible, there there's always bridges, and so we could still use another bridge in terms of a graduate transfer or two. Um, offensive line, still we need a graduate transfer. If we're talking extra credit, we don't need one, but um, it would be an extra. Same thing at receiver, outside receiver, um, a graduate transfer would help give us an additional number there. Those two positions. Uh, are, are probably at the biggest deficit still in terms of succession planning, numbers, and ability for what I'd like to see. Um, the next position would be possibly another defensive lineman, if we could find an exceptional defensive lineman similar to Jawan, uh, Ben Smiley. Um, if we could find another player similar to those two, um, it would be in that order. Uh, if I were then saying to finish this, uh, even though right now I'm good, but if to say, okay, if, if we kept working and there were possibilities, where might they be? Probably there. Coach, you mentioned when you got here how hard it was to recruit in-state. I believe you have three in-state guys in this class. I'm just curious, over the last two years, what are your thoughts on how you've recruited in the state and, and how do you approach that going forward? Yeah, I think we're improving significantly, and most of that has happened because doors are being opened with our, our progress, and it's so noticeable. And so the intrigue now is opening doors and players are more interested and again relationships are being established with my staff and the high school coaches and then so many of them are coming to see us practice and what they thought and then what they see they usually leave very impressed and there's just momentum that's being generated and we have a, a, a saying in our program right that trust is built with time and consistency so it's now been three years 
of time with consistency of behavior, treatment, and results. And so trust is starting to be established, which yields results. Take our last recruiting question here from Damon, then we'll switch gears over to the belt ball. Bronco, you mentioned at the beginning about the additional staff for recruiting that you've been able to bring on. How how do they help? Uh, just like what roles are they in and sure. how much of an impact have they had? Man, so in terms of the roles, uh, we were approximately half staffed in relation to our competitors when I arrived in the personnel area. Um, and so there are what are called it depends on which organization recruiting specialists, but all they do from the minute they arrive at work to the time they go home is finding, which means they're, or you can call them regional coordinators, where they have areas and they're responsible for every high school, every player within that footprint or that region um, to mine them, find them, and then put them through the evaluation process. Before we had those um, additional people, our coaches then after practice were then doing that. Um, which we were just simply late and behind. Some other staffs were finding and mining 24-7, that's an exaggeration, during the workday, while we were then coaching and then doing that, um, and we couldn't catch up fast enough. And so the, the regional coordinators or recruiting specialists, then the volume of players that we're finding relate in relation to the specific needs that we have is happening early, faster, and more accurate. Um, that is happening while we're practicing. And so those two things have just, and then with the momentum um, of how we're playing, that also is reflective of the coaches not having to recruit as much. So the playing product is improving while the finding is happening at the same time. And those two things are merging in a way that just is significantly different. Without the resources, um, it would be really difficult. And so Again, Carla has been really helpful in identifying that need right off, giving us the resources um, to develop our roster. And so I think the results certainly show that. I can't say it's all the organization, but it's a huge part. The, the progress we're making on the field, it's a combination of both those.